To each a tempo. An Ace Attorney and a Leap Beat Agents fan fiction, chapter 22. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go! It began with a spark. One bright instant, Phoenix understood that he couldn't give up. And since Mr. Pathos's testimony against Mr. Lowe is conclusive, more so than anything else presented in this case, I see no reason to prolong this trial. This court finds the defendant... OBJECTION! Uh, Mr. Wright? His fists shook against the stand. Strength rose in him because it wouldn't end like this. It couldn't. Your Honor. The spark caught inside him and rose higher. He heard feet moving in time. You can't. There are too many questions unanswered here. And Mr. Pathos isn't telling the whole story. A startled blink, and then the judge's face quickly darkened. I won't allow stalling, Mr. Wright, or wild accusations. Do you have evidence that Mr. Pathos is being untruthful? It was Phoenix's last shot. So don't, don't stop, stop me now. Don't, don't stop me now. And he'd chance the double edge. He slapped Pathos' articles onto the stand, the whole stack of them. These are the articles that Mr. Pathos writes. They're from a wide variety of publications, but they all have one thing in common. They argue the existence of Elite Beat Agents. Elite Beat Agents? Why, that sounds like a video game. They're suit-clad men with musical superpowers. Pure rumor and urban legend. Press on, the beat urged Phoenix. Push this advantage and push it hard. If Mr. Pathos makes his living theorizing about Elite Beat Agents, and he saw a chance to create that subject matter for himself. Why wouldn't he? Phoenix looked then to the witness stand. Pathos glared like knives, and that meant it was working. Here was one more lead to chase. I'm gonna go, 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 there's no stopping me. Phoenix had a team strong behind him. He pointed a challenge at Pathos, staring down the length of his arm. Music was playing in the park, and my client was wearing a suit. Those are known characteristics of elite beat agents, and that's all Mr. Pathos would need to create a media scandal. Not this time. Burning through the sky, yeah. 200 degrees, that's why they call me Mr. Fahrenheit. Do you deny it, Mr. Pathos? Do you or do you not deny that this was the opportunity of your journalistic career? That? You were fired from your previous job, weren't you, Mr. Pathos? Was this your chance to get back on top? You couldn't be more wrong. I couldn't possibly have planned this. Order! Order in the court! Just one moment, Mr. Wright. I'm traveling at the speed of light. I want to make a super man out of you. What are you proposing here? Phoenix thought, no, knew to a soaring beat. He held the pieces and he sensed where they fit. Consider this. Mr. Pathos saw Mr. Lowe before the murder and happened to be dressed the same way. He has ready access to the orchard alleyway. And he had something to gain from killing Morna Beasley and framing Stuart Lowe for the crime. The murderer can only be you, Mr. Pathos. Let us not forget the ink traces and dress shoe footprints found on the scene, which coincidentally match Mr. Pathos's favored pen color and his formal shoes. This is an alarming amount of coincidence indeed. Your response, Mr. Pathos? But he was smiling again, impervious to the rhythm and the chains around him. Is this really the strongest argument against me? I expected better of the renowned Phoenix Wright. Pathos's eyes narrowed. You're still using happenstance to accuse a man of murder. I propose that if there is no concrete evidence, there has been no wrongdoing on my part. We can prove it, Nick. You can hear it, can't you? The tune, the beat, the power shaking through his body and honing his tongue? Phoenix could be deaf and he'd still hear it. He'd feel it. But he and Maya and the agents had lacked concrete evidence all along. The distinctive pen hadn't even worked. It beaded right off Pathos. 
What more did they have to throw? Well, Mr. Wright, do you have evidence directly implicating Mr. Pathos? I'm a rocket ship on my way to Mars. I'm a collision course. I have a satellite. I'm out of control. Arms swayed in time around Phoenix, and he ground his teeth. The answer lay outside the box, but where? Phoenix. That voice. One more ally by his side. Phoenix looked to Maya. She stood there in her own body, shock and joy spreading on her face. All this music channeling. Oh, sis! You'll need something unusual. Something that normal circumstances can't explain. Something he can't hide. The court is waiting, Mr. Wright. I... I have evidence! Like an atom bomb His thoughts raced and settled on the biggest tangle of contradictions. He reached under the bench into his briefcase. The Orchard Alley's camera. The alley camera? The judge resettled his grip on the gavel. Uh, what was it, a motorcycle's throttle? But the identity of the person in that photo is impossible to determine. No, I mean the actual camera. It was tampered with. Someone yanked off a piece of casing and broke wires. I'm burning through the sky, yeah. 200 degrees, why they call me Mr. Fahrenheit. An electrical surge damaged the camera's recorded data. That surge appears to have been caused by deliberate damage. Does that camera piece have some trace of the tamperer on it? Did it? Melted edges, snapped wires, some kind of chippy thingy? They didn't have time for fingerprinting, so how could Pathos have left anything distinctive enough to- Try it the other way around, Phoenix. Other way around? Which would mean the camera piece leaving a trace on the tamperer. Phoenix looked to Pathos and didn't just see Frost anymore. He felt another racing heart, knew the slow boil of loathing, and knew chains tight enough to choke. And Phoenix remembered one lurid moment of a hand squeezed in his own, and the uneasy twitch of wrinkles around Pathos' eyes. Don't stop me! Don't stop me! Actually, damaging electrical equipment would be dangerous, wouldn't it, Mr. Edgeworth? Broken electrical wires would be dangerous, yes. Understanding knitted his brow. Even a standard household plug carries enough electrical current to burn. It's entirely possible that the camera tamperer was injured. Now the color came, a tightening of Pathos's jaw, shivering chains and the blue cold sting of fear. Phoenix smirked. Mr. Pathos, please lift your right hand to the court. Oh, I'm burning through the sky, yeah. 200 degrees, that's why they call me Mr. Fahrenheit. But Pathos stood silent, staring. He looked contemplatively to the stand. A hard flash of grudge, a memory of office space before the rhythm and the quivering locks drowned it out. May I ask a question, Mr. Wright? He's stalling. Don't get distracted. He just asked a question. Give him an answer, Nick. If your theory works so well, if you know this much, then what did I supposedly use to dispatch Miss Beasley? <sighs> Definitely stalling, but the point stood. Phoenix's mouth worked, and he tightened his fists on the stand. Stop me now! You, you've been evading police for days. That's plenty of time to dispose of a murder weapon. But he'd have to guess, slap a bandage on this hole, and Phoenix followed the symbol's beats, remembering someone fiery. But here's another interesting coincidence, Mr. Pathos. The murder weapon was something rounded. I proposed earlier that it was a pair of metal tongs Chef Flem carries. But if you do pass through her kitchen on a regular basis, the wielder could have just as easily been you. A queasy flare, outrage, coincidence. Pathos's eyes narrowed. Do you accuse witnesses with whatever pops into your head? For shame, Mr. Wright. And then the great courtroom doors banged open. Hold it! Time shattered. The court turned to watch Detective Gumshoe charge in, holding an evidence bag high. Wait, Your Honor, sir! Don't stop me. Don't stop me, yes, I'm Gumshoe didn't slow. He strode to the defense stand, tall and ferociously proud, Pathos flinching in his wake. I have decisive evidence here, the missing piece. Got it as fast as I could, pal. No evidence? Will a recess be necessary? And as the evidence was thrust into his hands, a microphone, solid and black gleaming within the plastic, Phoenix shook his head. No, Your Honor. I don't want to stop at all. 
It's got Nexus Broadcasting's logo printed on the bottom. Or where the fiddly dial is. This is a really high class piece of equipment. We found this because Chef LaFlamme said Mr. Pathos might have been messing around in the basement. His microphone was found behind the fuse box of the Orchard Bistro. The gallery murmured scandal. Defeat bled through the air around Pathos. The song faded, color and pitch echoing away. Good luck. Teammates stilled in crisp unison. The music was gone. Mr. Pathos is a former employee of Nexus, and since it's unlikely that the Orchard staff would have the same access to Nexus equipment, why did you put the microphone there, Mr. Pathos? Silence clung now. The world was three plain dimensions, and Pathos stood with his head bowed. This microphone feels like sturdy metal, and its size and shape match the wound on the victim's head. This is what you used, isn't it? And then you had to get rid of the murder weapon, rather than be caught with it. A heavy sigh, and Pathos brought his free hand to his temple, absently smoothing hair. That was early today, after the bistro closed for the night. Chef Laflamme didn't see me that time. I made sure of it. Her apprentice, Welp, must have passed by. I truly thought Cherry wouldn't say one word against me. Mr. Pathos, what are you saying? He's saying that he used the microphone to strike Miss Beasley. His fingerprints are probably all over it. My, no. I wouldn't be so sloppy. You may find skin traces in the mesh of the microphone's head, though. That part is difficult to clean properly. Gumshoe shuffled away to one side. The silence itched. The judge cleared his throat and didn't have anything to say. Phoenix leaned over his bench. Why, Mr. Pathos? Why did you kill her? Why do any of us do anything? What makes a person want to ruin another? Can you tell me that, Agent? Phoenix should have known this was coming. He stared back and said nothing. I... I can hear your kind. I hear them passing through the city, and I hear sudden music. The thought of that sort of chaos... Chaos? You know what I'm referring to. I don't. Could you clarify for the court? Pathos turned his gaze to Stuart. The court around them barely mattered. I'm sure there's some motive to their madness, but all I truly know about agents is that they descend without warning and they have a power over the human mind. When I worked for Nexus Broadcasting, I had everything. I had a career and a future until one moment of weakness, one report I lacked the sources for. They knew somehow. They must have planned which vital term report to sabotage because before I knew it, I held my desk context in a cardboard box. <laughs> the ten-year pen and a handshake one day, a pink slip the next. How many others have you ruined, Agent? You must forgive me for asking. Your patterns are quite difficult to track. You've been studying these agents? How? Pathos closed his eyes then. If I were more knowledgeable about electronics, my specialty is advertising, sharing information, putting a spin on it. I only know what I saw that day, three years ago, and what others have seen, and what I can hear. I'm afraid I still don't understand. What does this have to do with the murder of Miss Mona Beasley? Murder. That's a word I've been coming to terms with lately. This is what happened. I visited the orchard for lunch, as I said. And then I knew chaos. I felt it. The rhythm agent stir. Nearby, just like when it was turned on me. I left the bistro and followed it, listening to the rhythm, but I... I was ignoring its pull, I suppose, refusing to be sucked in. He felt Stuart's assist, and he went to it. Maybe you heard the music from the wedding. Oh, it was more than that. The woman was frightened, then high on courage, and then relieved. The same relief I knew for an instant before my career ended. The poor fool, she had no idea what had just been done to her. Pausing then, Pathos gazed at the stand. He watched a bitter time no one else could see. I had prepared myself with a microphone like the ones agents use. I didn't know what I would do with it until I was in the bushes, digging in my briefcase for a solid object. Here was a woman near the end of her life and freshly cursed. I could keep her from ruin like mine. It made perfect sense at the time. The court was silent. Pathos smiled, weakly. It sounds terrible aloud, doesn't it? Mr. Pathos, what did you do then? I realized what I had done then. I put the microphone back in my briefcase and began to run. My memory is somewhat scattered. I do apologize. You evaded police too well to be working off of panic, Mr. Pathos. Try to remember. 
For a long moment, Pathos thought. But if he really realized what he did, he must have panicked. Or felt something, at least. That snapped into place in Phoenix's mind. He picked up the sketched map that showed Pathos's flight path and Maya's widening yellow markings. If he only panicked after he realized what he did, that must have been what Stewart sensed and chased into the alley. I couldn't think much of anything at the time. The alley door was locked as I left it. I couldn't recall where my keys were, even though they turned out to be in my pocket. I suppose I jumped the fence, then... The next thing I recall is looking up at the camera. I couldn't risk being caught on film. Your hand? Another weak smile. I did say that I'm not skilled with electronics. Very well, Mr. Wright. He removed his right hand from jacket pocket. He lifted it and spread his fingers. There, between his ring and little fingers, hid the red, glistening electrical burn. It's been a rather painful reminder these past days. While I stood inside my front door, with the burn freshly throbbing and my senses returning, I could hear the agent. I could hear him startled and scared as the police caught him. Finally, after all this time... His smile twitched its throes. Pathos's eyes gleamed cold again, and he stood proud. Here is my confession. I killed Morna Beasley in cold blood, and I regret it. She didn't deserve to be caught up in this. I truly wish I hadn't, but I've achieved my goal today. A chill ran down Phoenix's spine. What? You've made a grave mistake this time, agents. Pathos fished in his pocket, producing a device like the silver evolution of Gumshoe's frequency detector. The green Nexus logo bold on its back. Did I finally jam your radio lines? Did you have no choice but to use your powers? Just tried to hide it this time. This entire courtroom heard you. The world knows elite beat agents now. All this effort, all the care and white lies, only for the agents to throw it all away assisting Phoenix. He was suddenly queasy, tightening his fists, empty inside. They revealed themselves for him. They came to his aid, and now... And... What, Mr. Pathos? The music. The powers. The color drained from his face. Mr. Wright's display a few minutes ago. How could you miss it? It was nothing supernatural, I assure you. Mr. Wright makes spectacular comebacks on a regular basis. Yes, he can be quite amazing to watch. Very theatrical. He's downright obtrusive. Just this once, Phoenix wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. B but You might want to follow your own advice, Mr. Pathos. You're accusing a man based on happenstance. Do you have concrete evidence that Mr. Wright is one of your agents? A stifling silence. The court stared. Pathos struggled and couldn't manage to smile again. Well played, all of you. I can't prove my case. I've been working from my own experience, from what I know to be true. One man's experience is no evidence, is it? You win, agents. I have nothing left. Hmm... Whether agents exist or not is a moot point, Mr. Pathos. You committed murder and then attempted to get an innocent man convicted for it. Another trial would determine your fate. Bailiffs, please remove Mr. Pathos. Pathos stood there unmoving. The gallery's buzz sluiced off of him. The clicking handcuffs and the stern hands at his elbows couldn't touch him. This was no victory. Phoenix knew with a slow wrench in his gut. Hold it! The bailiffs paused. Pathos looked up, stunned and fighting again for an expression. And Stuart was on his feet, leaning on the defendant's box like he strained at a leash. He's not going to. He can't. He has to, Nick. He helps people. If... Stuart's fists tightened, bloodless. His mouth twitched before he managed to speak. If somebody tried to help you, and they made a mess of it, they'd be sorry. They really would, every time they think about it. Every day of these three years. It never should have turned out this way. I can't prove it for you, but please, believe me. One instance of unreadable stare, of thoughts churning in Pathos's eyes before the bailiffs moved onward and dragged him away. The courtroom doors creaked and slammed, and Pathos was gone. The judge sat tall now. Well, I believe we've answered all the questions raised, and if there are no further objections... Phoenix looked across the court to Edgeworth's fraction of a smirk. 
I will now announce my verdict. This court finds the defendant, Mr. Stuart Lowe, not guilty. Phoenix let out a sigh. For better or worse, it was over. Come on, Nick. It's been forever since we talked to the agents. Maybe longer than that. What are we doing standing around? He'd really have to teach Maya to tell time someday. Swiping confetti bits from his hair, Phoenix smiled to match her. To Each a Tempo was written by Pyrosaur. Ace Attorney and Elite Beat Agents are owned by Capcom and Inis, respectively. The narrator for this story is Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of Phoenix Wright is Lasney. The voice of Maya Fey is Miki. The voice of Miles Edgeworth is Lazy Ace Dia. The voice of Dick Gumshoe is Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of the judge is also Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of Mia Fey is Maxi. The voice of Agent J is Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of Agent Spin is Cement City. The voice of Agent Chieftain is Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of Agent Derek is Crosby Sloop, the real Slim Shady. The voice of Agent Morris is also Crosby Sloop, the real Slim Shady. The voice of Agent Missy is Airbrica. The voice of Agent Fox is Galen Skibiak. The voice of C.R. Pathos is Todd Wilson. The song sung in this chapter was Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.